He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental, a podcast from RNZ in which we're exploring the periodic table which is having its 150th anniversary this year. I'm Professor Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology. And I'm Alison Balance, a science producer at RNZ. And as we wander alphabetically around the elements, I'm starting to get a better sense of the shape of the table and why things are in the place they are. <laughs> well, I've got some bad news for you, Alison, because no. our element today... I'm, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> but our element today might not sort of sit nicely on the periodic table where you think it might. And the element today that we're talking about here in episode 18 is cerium. And it's a part of a bunch of elements that have quite a lot to do with making the periodic table quite messy in places. Well, even the element name's a bit confusing. Cerium sounds a bit like <laughs> cesium and a bit like curium, but it's neither of those. What is it? Indeed. It's not one of the better known elements, not like carbon from last week she sighs fondly <laughs> <laughs> no okay so again the vital statistics cerium so the chemical symbol ce atomic number 58 we'll talk about where that puts it on the periodic table very soon it was discovered in 1803 and the reason it got its name cerium was because the first asteroid series was discovered just a couple of years before cerium was found and the asteroid series was, for some unknown reason, named after the Roman goddess of agriculture. Now, where does this sit on the periodic table? It sits in the lanthanoid elements, or the rare earth elements. Okay, And this is essentially the first lanthanoid or rare earth element that we've encountered in our journey thus far. Now, those of you listening, get out your periodic tables, have a look, and... The first question you should ask is, what are those two lines of elements at the bottom of the periodic table? The top line of those are what we call the lanthanoids. The bottom line are what we call the actinoids. And if you think back to actinium, way back when, that's where they get their name from. Right, so as instructed, here's my copy of the periodic table, <laughs> which I carry with me at all times while Absolutely. I'm making this podcast. <laughs> um, so looking down row six... Numbers 55, 56, 57, and oh my goodness, <laughs> the next one is 72. So it is. <laughs> cesium, BA, mm -hmm. barium, yep. LA, lanthanum. Yep, absolutely. And lanthanum is where the lanthanoids get their name from. They used to be called lanthanides, but we've changed. So oh, you're as bad as biologists changing oh. names. <laughs> <laughs> All you listeners of a certain age, you have to update now. So lanthanum, well... It's, let's say it's possibly the first lanthanoid. There's a bit of discussion around about that, actually. But cerium is a member of the lanthanoids, atomic number 58, so that puts it as being the second lanthanoid, but it's the first on the separate line down on the bottom of the periodic table. And in fact, some periodic tables actually include lanthanum amongst the lanthanoids. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so why do these guys get their own special line? Well... They are a series of elements. They're all metals, for starters. The atomic numbers of these guys go all the way from 57 to 71, and they get their own line because they all behave chemically extremely similarly, not just similarly, but very, very similarly. The reason that they do is that they have got what we call F electrons. Wait a minute. What the F are F electrons? <laughs> well, as we fill up... Our electrons, as we get more and more electrons in our atoms, we start with S orbitals, we then go to P orbitals, we then go to D orbitals, and then we go to F orbitals. And then, if we had any, we'd go to G orbitals. Simple. <laughs> Clear as mud. Carry on. No, no, yeah, okay. So, I say they behave very, very similarly, and indeed they do. And when you have deposits of lanthanoids, you tend not to get single elements in there, you tend to get big mixtures of all of these lanthanoids. They do tend to occur together. As I say, they're all metals, and they're quite reactive metals, but if you leave them out on oxygen for a while, they get an oxide layer, and that makes them sort of unreactive. If you remove the oxide layer, then they go a little bit crazy, as uh, we'll talk about in a minute, okay? That's why they get their own line, because they all react very, very chemically, similarly, because of these F 
electrons. And so that's why the periodic table looks like it does, why we've got these two funny lines down the bottom. Now, what you could do if you really wanted to would be to put those two lines in the slots that they should be in the periodic table. But that would make it unfeasibly wide. <laughs> and that's the reason why they put them down there, just because it would be too wide otherwise. And people are coming up with different ways to display the periodic table. We've got these beautiful sort of spiral periodic tables now, three-dimensional things. But this is the easiest way of doing it. So you mean the current periodic table, which we've talked about in a previous episode, Berkelium, as being beautifully symmetrical at the moment. It's really only beautifully symmetrical because we've made this purely aesthetic decision to go, oh no, if we just pop these ones down the bottom, <laughs> then this, we get to keep the symmetry. Oh, it would still look nice with them in the actual periodic table. As I say, it's too wide. So. <laughs> <laughs> now you've mentioned that there are also known as rare earth elements, and yes. I've heard of rare earth elements in the news, mm -hmm. and I know that we use them in electronics, yep. things such as mobile phones, and there yep. are occasional scaremongering reports about problems with supply. Oh, we're going to run out. E well, yeah, they're, they're not necessarily all that rare. Some of them are, but cerium, for example, is the most abundant of all of the so-called rare earths. And in terms of a comparison, it's, there's about as much cerium on planet Earth as there is copper and zinc. So, you know, there's a fair bit of, of, of both of those guys. You talk about, you know, problems with supply and everything. That reason is that the majority of deposits of these lanthanoids or rare earths, they tend to be sort of in Russia and China. So they've kind of got a, uh, a grip on the world production. But having said that, they're not necessarily that rare. You've probably got some on you at the moment. You'll have very possibly some in your phone, very possibly. It's used in optical glass. So if you're wearing glasses, uh, spectacle lenses often contain uh, cerium. I do wear glasses, so I probably have some on my head. <laughs> it's also good in windows. Uh, it acts as a UV filter, so ceric oxide, cerium dioxide. It's also used as a polish for really, really high-quality glass. You're talking sort of telescopes, microscopes, those sorts of things. You probably find it in the kitchen unwittingly if you've got a self-cleaning oven. No, nah, don't have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wish too, yes. <laughs> But in self-cleaning ovens, again, ceric oxide will be in there, and that's a really good oxidising agent, so it oxidises all the gunk. Cerium metal by itself, uh, as I said before, it will react with air. This, this tarnishes, and it's sort of, I guess another word for that is rust. Uh, so it forms a sort of an oxide layer like iron rust. Now, if you actually sort of scratch this, if you scratch through the oxide layer, what you'll find is that cerium is very, very pyrophoric. Now, oh, remember, we've talked about that before. We did. We talked about that with cesium. We said that pyrophoric is something that catches fire sort of spontaneously. And so if you do this, if you get the oxide layer off cerium, then you'll get sparks and it will go up in flames. And that makes it extremely useful in things that are not now as common as they used to be, uh, cigarette lighters, for example. So when you strike a cigarette lighter, you basically take the oxide off your cerium and that gives you sparks. And for a nice analogy like that, if you've ever used a, uh, a metal grinder on a piece of steel or something like that, you get all those sparks coming off the grinder. That's iron doing exactly the same thing. You're taking the oxide layer off iron. Pure iron in oxygen reacts very, very quickly. And in fact, there have been examples. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here for the iron episode. There have been examples of bushfires and stuff being started by people playing golf with uh, metal clubs and striking them on a stone and getting sparks from that. But you don't get cerium golf clubs. You, <laughs> no, you surely don't. They'd be a little bit expensive, I think. So uh, a host of other uses used in catalytic converters, and that helps decomposing nitrogen oxides, which you don't want. Those are those brown things that come out of your tailpipe. Your car's tailpipe, Alan. Your car's tailpipe, <laughs> sorry. Yes, indeed. So you go nitrogen oxides to nitrogen gas, it's very, very useful in diesel engines, in fact, because often you get little particulates coming out of the car's tailpipe in diesel engines. And cerium dioxide, in that case, again, being a good oxidising agent, helps to get rid of those little particulates. Gosh, for something that I hadn't really heard of before, it's popping up all over the place. Anything else interesting you'd like to throw into this episode? Let's say a fingernail-sized piece of cerium metal. If you leave it out in air, it will corrode completely in about a year. Right. So we didn't actually have a tagline or a theme for cerium at the top of the story, so I'm going to give it one and I'm going to call it combustible 
based on its pyrophoricity and <laughs> confusing. Combustible and confusing. That's my summary of cerium. And this has been episode 18 of Elemental, a podcast from RNZ. We're online at rnz.co.nz forward slash chemistry, but you already knew that if you were listening to us online. And you can find us in all the usual podcast apps. We're back next time with chlorine. But until then, it's cheerio from me, Alan Blackman from AUT. And me, Alison Balance, Kia Pai Tora. 